good morning. Well, I should say yeah, good morning, I guess. Yeah, it is kind of later than I thought. <laughs> Top of the morning to you. <laughs> it's like we only got 50, uh, 14 people or 13 people in here right now. Uh, it's about, it is time to start though. So, uh, anybody have any questions before we get started? Uh, I mean, I know you don't have any questions from, you know, the last class, for instance, but if you have anything that's bugging you about the book or anything that you bought or any kind of stuff like that, you can ask me now or you can ask questions as I'm going along. The syllabus. I'm taking it, a look at the course schedule and like um, half of it's cut off. Yeah, there's a, when I converted it to a PDF, it actually got lost. When you, you're talking about like one of the columns on the start, on the side is jacked up. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, uh, I've got to fix that. It, it happened when I converted it to a PDF. I don't know why it was perfect as a doc, a Word doc. Uh, I'll fix that, but I'm going to go over that schedule too. The only column you're missing is really what we're doing for lab. And if you don't have me for lab, that part doesn't even matter to you. Uh, but for the record, in case anybody wants to know what, what you're missing this week, the first lab is going to be a spreadsheet review. So that's the first lab we're doing this week. Uh, so that, that's that's the only thing you're missing from that schedule yet <laughs> but i'll have another version and by the way when i do update the syllabuses i will start with that same name it says phy 241 d01b i'll put an underscore and then i'll put the date so like if i make the correction today it'll say 011122 okay and you always just look for the latest date and that'll be the, the correct version to use okay all right, so I'm uh, Billy Younger. I've been teaching here at TCC for, I think, 11 or 12 years now. And before that, I taught at College of the Albemarle in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Uh, I was there for 10 years. And before that, I was at uh, NC State, Chapel Hill, East Carolina, uh, places like that, uh, where I was pursuing my PhD at Chapel Hill and doing a uh, master's at NC State and a master's at East Carolina as well. So I am now a teacher here at TCC. I'm also the department head. So some of my responsibilities increased. That's made me have to be a little bit more time efficient. So those of you who've heard about me and uh, you know my willingness to be helpful to you guys, uh, that's still going to be. But one thing I'm not going to do anymore is I'm not changing the due dates on homeworks or tests or anything like that. So I got to stick to that. But you can still do them late. You're just going to lose points based on how many days you are late so if you uh do test uh, or do a homework that was due at 11 59 on uh monday night if you do it at 12:01 a.m um tuesday morning then you're going to lose like four points and if you do it 24 hours later than that you're going to lose eight points and so on and so forth so just make sure you do those. The good news is I've got all the dates set uh, and they'll actually be corrected. Right now they're they're set to the Monday, Wednesday schedule instead of Tuesday, Thursday, but by tonight, all your uh, homeworks in, in my lab and mastering will have exactly the right dates on it. The calendar and my syllabus has exactly the right dates for the online test and for the midterm and the final as well. So you can go ahead and put those in your calendar on your phone, for instance, to remind you. Uh, the big thing is, inevitably students will miss an online test. I don't want you to do that. Please don't do that. So definitely try to set an alarm in your phone uh, on a particular those particular dates to remind you to do it. Uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to share my screen and show you a little bit about Canvas and specifically go over the syllabus. So uh, y'all probably already found this. This is a link to our, our Zoom meeting. Uh, hopefully we only do this once more, uh, supposedly on the 18th, we're going back to face to face, in which case we won't need to do the zoom link. Uh, but in the future, if we ever, uh, do do a zoom link for maybe an office hour or something like that, uh, we could use that, that passcode again and that meeting again, I just got to add another date to it. No big deal. Uh, or I'll send you a new one, whatever. So you won't see this, any of the things that aren't checked, you, you don't see, so don't flip out if you don't see an easy file drop spot that's just stuff i've put in there this is the stuff that tidewater community colleges wants you to make sure you have access to canvas support zoom support academic calendar barnes and nobles purchase stuff uh so on and so forth uh, i usually keep that window minimized so i can uh 
you know, quickly see the other stuff. I've actually got three or four convenient drop file areas uh, just because I, I copied it over from another course and it had one already. So uh, this part is probably the most important part for you on a daily basis anyways. Uh, this is a very important uh, discussion of the importance of syllabuses. And I cannot stress to you how important a syllabus is. This is your syllabus. This is the doc version. So you, you can't see that. That's why I didn't publish it. You only get the PDF. I got to fix it. But right here, you'll find this. And then probably tomorrow, you'll find this with a date on the end. And that'll be the modern one. Uh, the important thing about the syllabus is I've seen students that deserved an A not pay attention to the syllabus and end up getting a B or a C in some cases. Uh, in fact, I have one get a D. So that's kind of wrong. I mean, they shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't ignore your syllabus so bad that you cost yourself grades. Similarly, I've also seen people that I didn't think really deserved an A get an A because they really paid close attention to what the syllabus told them. So the syllabus is really, really super important. It tells you all the things you're responsible for. It tells you how I calculate the grades. That therefore allows you to do the same calculation yourself and confirm that your grade is exactly what I'm saying it is. And uh, that's something you should know how to do. And it's really just a weighted average. That's what most college professors use is a weighted average. Uh, you should be able to calculate a weighted average. If you don't, there's one uh, explained to you on my uh, physics solutions YouTube channel. Uh, you can see down here, uh, this is a formula sheet. This is the accepted formula sheet for all the chapters of the textbook. It's both 241 and 242. <coughs> You're allowed to have any of these equations or any part of this, this sheet, uh, you're allowed to have it on your tests when you take them, okay? Uh, generally speaking, what I'm choosing is the numbered equations throughout the chapter, but occasionally I will, you know, derive an equation for you that maybe even isn't even in your book, much less numbered, and I'll say, this is an equation you can use. So whenever you see me say that, you write down that equation and box it off and highlight it with pink or blue or yellow or whatever. So you can know, hey, this is one I can write on that equation sheet and bring with me, okay? Uh, I'm not gonna keep track of that. I'm not gonna write that anywhere before you. I tell you in the class, that's why you know to do it, okay? <laughs> and when I look at it, if I see it, I will immediately know whether it was allowed or not. So. Uh, keep in tra uh, keep track of that. Pay attention during labs. Look for me to say, hey, this part uh, is an equation that you can use uh, on your tests. This is a text document that gives you all the videos that I have on my YouTube channel up until uh, January 10th, 2022. Okay. Uh, the first part of it starts off with astronomy, so you can scroll past that unless you find something interesting and go to the physics part, and you'll see it has a title that's usually pretty descriptive and, and lets you know what's being done, and then it'll have like what level course it's for, so it'll say ALG for algebra-based physics or calc for calculus-based physics or uh, CON for conceptual physics. And some of those will have all those, so if the word calc's in there anywhere, you know it's good for your class. Uh, if the word algebra is in there, it's actually good for your class as well, but it's just not high enough a level to sign for a calculus-based physics. So you can do that. And not only that, it'll also have a link to it. It'll actually have the, the URL to the specific uh, video. So you can just literally cut and paste that into your uh, browser window, and it'll take you right to that video as opposed to going to my uh, YouTube channel and then searching for the video you're looking for. Okay. This is a link to my YouTube channel. I put it all over the place. It's a couple places on your syllabus as well as here. It's just www.youtube.com slash Billy Younger Physics Solutions. Uh, that's it. And you, uh, I would su suggest you subscribe to it, at least during the class. So every time I post a new video, you'll get an email reminding you or letting you know, hey, Mr. Younger posted something. And you'll be able to see the title and know whether it's for 241 or 242. So uh, at least subscribe for long enough to get this course over with and uh, then you know, unsubscribe if you want, that's fine with me. Uh, also, when I'm doing these, you'll sometimes see that uh, when I'm doing the lectures online, they, uh, the pages that I'm writing on sometimes becomes digitized or uh, sort of looks like uh, Minecraft or something. Uh, and that's because of a bad bandwidth. So in addition to having the videos available, uh, which the, usually the videos should come up fine because they're not gonna be sl slowed down on my side because I'm recording it here. Uh, but you might not be able to see the pages that well. So I actually take a photograph of the 
notes that I take each day and I post them on here and they'll be labeled like PHY242D01B underscore and it'll say 011122 for January 11th, 2022, uh, 2022. So there's the Google Docs. That's where you can find all that stuff. You'll see practice tests are here. After that, there's online tests. That's not supposed to be available yet, so I'll unpublish it. Uh, but I usually give you a whole week to do your online test, or at least from like Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday till Sunday, uh, or Monday or something like that. So I always give you at least over a weekend, but I try to give you a whole week to get it done. You get multiple attempts. You'll see how that's spelled out later. Here's where uh, if we have to take online midterm and final, uh, this is where they'll be posted. Hopefully we won't. Hopefully we'll go back to classroom. Uh, here's the prerequisites for this course. Uh, I'm not saying you really have to know how to use cylindrical and, uh, and spherical coordinates, but it would really help if you could see them just enough to be familiar with them because it allows me to, to do notations that save a lot of time. Uh, so I'm not really making you do anything with them. I'm just going to be using them to represent little vectors so you can get a feel for which direction they point in and stuff like that. That's why I give you these Cartesian cylindrical spherical coordinate videos. There's also a video on sig fig, scientific notation, unit and dimension analysis. Uh, that's something I expect you to know from 241. You should know how to add or subtract vectors by drawing. That's something I expect you to know from 241. And actually, they probably expect you to know from pre-calculus. And world's greatest vector addition problem. Uh, I say that because basically I show you all the different ways someone can specify a vector and, and do enough vectors that you actually get a good experience of how to add them. So there's a video on uh, how to add vectors algebraically as opposed to by drawing. OK, so definitely might want to look those things over if you feel a little rusty on any of that or you don't know. You know, if I draw two vectors tail to tail or head to tail, uh, if you can't immediately draw the subtraction of the two in either order, A minus B or B minus A, and the addition of the two, A plus B or B plus A, uh, then you probably need to look back over these two things. Okay, not they're short. These things that aren't full lectures, they're usually five or 10 or 15 minutes. This one, on the other hand, is a lecture, so that would be uh, in the fall case, I think they were an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, there are some that are 50, 50 minutes, and then there's some that are three hours from summers. So uh, you can <laughs> see that. You'll see where your homeworks are. This says January 16th. We'll find out later. Since you're a Tuesday, Thursday class, your uh, conceptual homework will be due on Monday, not, not Sunday. And your chapter homework, the actual problems, will be due on uh, Wednesday, not Tuesday. So both of these dates will go up by one. So it'll be 17 and this will be 19. That's the part I got to change. Uh, and that's what I said I'd, I'd have finished by tonight. So all those dates will be perfect by tomorrow. Uh, here's week two's stuff. The way these things go, is this is a lot of stuff you don't necessarily need. These demos are super, super awesome. And I, I want you to look at them because that's the kind of stuff I'd normally do in my class. Uh, but because I'm at home now, I can't do because I don't have all that equipment here. And plus, I'd probably burn the house down. Uh, I do a little bit more exciting stuff than this. I usually make lightning bolts shoot out my fingers and out my toes and stuff like that. Hopefully, we'll get to do that later. Uh, here's one of my Charge and Coulomb's Law videos. So this is more or less an uh, entire uh, first half of Chapter 21. As you go further down, except for the homework, these things become less relevant. So when I post today's lecture, it'll be right above this one, and it'll have some name that's descriptive like this. It won't have a password on it because that's the passwords for using Studio, which is part of Canvas. I'm not using that. I'm putting it on my YouTube channel, so uh, you'll have a link to a YouTube channel for today's video. Uh, I usually keep uh, maybe one week in advance up as well. Not necessarily, but usually do. And you can see all these are in here. As the semester goes, more of them will open up. But now it's time to show you the syllabus. OK, so make sure you watch your syllabus video and make sure you know about the important documents, all that good stuff. Now let's see how this turns out. We've already been warned that one of our columns is missing. OK. So this is section D01B. This is our meeting times. 
we should be meeting in JC12. I tell you to see the COVID related notes. There's one set of COVID related notes in here uh, that are in red. And it's mostly for people taking online classes, but it, it applies for people that are taking uh, offline classes as well. Actually, I should say it the other way around, but either way, it's, it's something you got to know. <clears throat> If a room is being used as a class and a laboratory, do not eat in that room, okay? Uh, just from a physics standpoint, which is probably the safest, uh, you're still going to be subject to eating radioactive materials. We, we use radioactive liquids uh, in our labs. Sometimes we have radioactive solids, all sorts of cool stuff like that. So if you ingest those, that's not a good day, okay? That's not something you want to do. Plus, we have lead. Uh, all sorts of stuff that that really is toxic and, and an insult to the brain, an insult to your metabolism, all sorts of stuff. So don't eat in a in a lab. Uh, biology has bio, biohazards in addition to poisons, so that's even worse. Uh, chemistry has a buttload of poisons and explosives and all sorts of stuff. So don't eat in a lab. It's not us being turds. It's just us being uh, safety conscious. We don't want to kill our students. That's we get really bad reviews when our students die. So <laughs> it's a suboptimal outcome. So anyway, this is my sense of humor, by the way. I, I make a lot of jokes and hopefully that's entertaining. Uh, most of them are dad jokes, so, so it's probably not. For your own safety and the longevity of the lab equipment, I want you to refrain from touching any lab equipment until you've been taught how to use it. And then once you've been taught how to use it, I would suggest you only do the things we taught you. Uh, don't go, you know, MacGyvering it. This, that's not a good day. Something bad could happen if you start playing MacGyver with it and like you get electrocuted. Uh, and really, again, we get really bad reviews when you guys get electrocuted. So uh, <laughs> some labs may require safety goggles, gloves, aprons, stuff like that. So when we're in the actual room, having a lab in the lab room, uh, if you walk to your station and it, there's a pair of uh, goggles there, then that means you need to put on goggles. And if there's some gloves there, if there's one pair for each student, then all your students need to put them on. Uh, if there's just one pair per table, that, that means there's some part of the lab where some person's going to have to don that glove to do something. Uh, if they're, all the aprons are there, that means y'all all have to don them. Okay. So th those are the rules for safety in the lab. I just want to make sure everybody's on board with that. Again, this is more pedagogy stuff we're required to put in. Uh, even though this is technically not an internet class, you are required to have a reliable access to a computer with internet service. Uh, that's mainly because of the homework uh, system, but also just you would be at a real disadvantage because I put so many links and stuff on Canvas uh, that it would be unfair to you for having all those other students get access to those things and you don't. Okay, this is the package with this exact ISBN that the bookstore is selling that comes with the book and access to the My Lab and Mastering stuff. Uh, I think this one actually comes with a binder ready version of the book. Uh, there's another one that the bookstore sells if you really want to go on the cheap and you don't mind reading electronic books. Uh, then you can go for that, which will be a little cheaper because they're not actually printing out any book for you. They're just going to give you access to my lab and mastering where you can find the e-textbook. So that's the cheapest way. The second cheapest way would be going with this package with the binder ready book. Uh, actually, you could maybe even do cheaper than that if you really insist on having a book, but you don't uh, necessarily uh, care whether it's up to date or not. You could, in principle, buy the one with the e-book. And if you still wanted to have a hard physical copy of the book, then a hardcover or a soft cover, whichever you want, then you can buy the third edition, which you can find quite cheap at various outlets because the third edition doesn't differ a whole lot from the fourth edition. The problem would come in like if I assign you problem 82 from chapter 15, uh, chapter 15 number problem 82 is probably different in the fourth edition than it is in the third edition. So you just need to check the ebook for that kind of thing. But other than that, the old book would be fine. So that's that's even cheaper than the uh, binder ready version, but not quite as cheap as just the ebook. Uh, in addition to the book and the uh, my lab and mastering access, you also need a ruler, a protractor, a pen, a pencil, eraser. I say graph paper would be 
helpful, but really what I mean is if you don't have graph paper, there's going to be some point where I'm going to make you make graph paper out of Excel and you have to print it and it's a pain in the butt and you probably don't want to do that. So I would suggest you have, you know, maybe 10 sheets of uh, graph paper that are, aren't all mangled. And you will need a scientific calculator and uh, you're allowed to use the one on your phone when you need to, but that's not going to be good enough on test. You're not ever going to have your cell phone with you during a test. Uh, unless you cleared it with me because you're on call or on duty or something like that. So you have to have a separate scientific calculator uh, for this class. It doesn't have to be super fancy. You know, it can be the $9 version they sell at uh, Food Lion. That'd be fine. Uh, you really just need one that has the button that says SIN in it, and it should have a, a button that's like times 10 to the X or something like that, at least. If it's got those buttons, you're good to go. Here's my COVID related, related warning that I told you. Uh, I called it a caveat. I don't know why I used the word caveat. Uh, I'm always trying to you know, improve my vocabulary and other people's as well. So maybe y'all don't know that word and you do now. You probably heard the phrase caveat emptor, which means buyer beware. So the beware part is the caveat, it's a rule, okay? So here's the rule. In the event the school switches to online learning only, students will either need a webcam and the respondent's lockdown browser, or you will need to take your midterm and final exam at a testing center if they are available. So you can take it at our testing center, that's free, but sometimes when they close the campus down for on, uh, and make it online, the testing center is not allowed to open either. If that's the case, then it's not available to us. If you happen to be taking this class from some other state or some other city, you might be lucky enough to find a testing center at a local school. Uh, sometimes a teacher will do it for you for a small fee or an administrator. Uh, they have to clear that with me. There's a process for that. Or you might even find a testing center that just does it for money. Uh, I haven't really found any of those. So uh, I know Pearson makes some of those testing centers, but I don't know if they'll actually do this or not. Uh, I haven't had anybody do it yet. So anyways, you'll need to uh, be able to do a test online with the Respondus Lockdown Browser. And I use the camera. You're going to uh, by taking the midterm and the final, if that's the way we do it, you'll have to use the camera to show your entire workspace, uh, everything you can reach, show me the front and back of every piece of paper you have, uh, show me your ID right next to your face so I can compare the two to make sure you're really the person taking the test and that's really the person that's uh, registered for the course. Uh, all that good stuff. And then uh, they watch you and I have the ability to watch you at any time. I, you know, occasionally we'll just drop in. So make sure you dress appropriately, obviously. Uh, you probably don't want to be drinking on the camera. I've had that happen before as well. So uh, if, you, if a little glass of wine relaxes, you just don't show it to me. I don't, <laughs> we're not allowed to drink in class. Okay. Uh, anyways, but yeah, I've got students doing that before. You can crack me up. So now, this is the topics that we're going to cover. Really, what we do is we do uh, electricity and magnetism. And in fact, back when I took the equivalent of this course, this semester was just electricity and magnetism. I think I had one chapter from Thermo, uh, and that's usually what it is. But that's when you're taking it at a university where they spread it out over three uh, semesters, because the first semester will be Newton's Laws and usually Thermo. And then the second semester, uh, we'll either finish up thermo that you didn't get to in the first semester, or it'll just jump right into electricity and optics. And then the last semester will be modern physics. So that includes relativity, quantum mechanics, nuclear physics, elementary particle physics, uh, cosmology, that kind of stuff. Uh, in this section, the way we do it here at TCC, and, and most com community colleges have to do it this way because you can't entice a student to take a three semester course. We basically fit our relativity in and maybe our elementary particles, or excuse me, yeah, maybe our elementary particles in, in 241. And then in 242, we fit in quantum mechanics and maybe nuclear physics. So that's what we do in this semester. You'll see that we do electricity magnetism, then we'll go back and hit that, uh, hit the thermodynamics, which includes the ideal gas laws. And then finally, we end up on quantum mechanics. Uh, so the assignments, each week there will be two or more online assigned homework ass uh, assignments uh, posted by Monday to be completed by 11.59 on Monday. So right now the dates are showing as if you're a Monday, Wednesday class, but uh, they're gonna be changed to be due as if it really is a Tuesday, Thursday class. That's what I told you I'd have done tonight. 
So just you know, keep an eye on that. So tomorrow you should be able to copy down all those dates and they'll be exactly right. Uh, and you can ask me if, you, if you're not sure. But anyways, what's going to happen is every chapter will have one set of concept problems and I'll have one, two, or even three sets of problem problems for that chapter. The concept questions are due by 11.59 p.m. on Monday. The actual pro physics problems assignments are always due on, by 11.59 on Wednesday, okay? Uh, you can do them late, but you're gonna lose points for each you know, day that you're late. And it, it, the day starts one second after the due date. So uh, if you're one second late, beyond the due date, then you're automatically going to get that one day late uh, penalty. So don't do that. We don't want you doing that. There will be online tests in it, which you are allowed to use your book, any book, your notes, any anybody else's notes, Google. You can Google stuff, all that stuff. The one thing you can't do is you can't uh, look at notes or look at web pages or pictures that anybody has taken since the beginning of the open test. So the day that I open the test, whatever time that is, you make a note of that. And if you see anything that's been made since that date, then you're not supposed to be looking at it. And that is cheating. Okay. Uh, but like I said, you shouldn't, you know, that shouldn't matter. Really what you're trying to do with those tests is this is your opportunity to work a lot more problems by doing the practice test and also by doing the online test, because I give you the online test and you'll have multiple tries uh, usually I give you two or three tries and each time you do uh, basically you get extra credit points for it uh, by me grading it based on your highest one that you got so that's good uh, the the practice test will actually disappear after uh, after the due date of the actual test and when we do the final I have a, a practice final as well for you guys usually in the same form as the others where it's electronic and you can take it over and over but sometimes I just have to print out one as a practice test. Uh, the test should be three to six problems three concept uh, questions and their due, due dates are shown on the schedule so when you look at schedule those due dates are set we, we got to use those dates they shouldn't change. The midterm and comprehensive final exam that word just disappeared on all versions of my syllabus I don't know how it did but I got to fix that. Uh, no cell phones can be within reach unless you clear it with me first. Your paper will be verified as blank you'll get the equation sheet as I told you. And uh, of course, you can also have the equations that I allow you. That's why you got to pay attention to my lectures. You're allowed a pencil, an eraser, and scientific calculator. Uh, you can bring a pen if you really wanted, but pencils would probably be better for a test. Uh, the final exam is actually longer than a normal class period. It's two hours and 10 minutes. So I need you to be prepared to come 45 minutes early or to, or to stay 45 minutes late in order for you to get that amount of time. Uh, if you can't do that, you need to let me know about a week in advance and then we'll find some way to work around it. The deal is the midterm and final are the tests where you're taking exactly the same test. Each student has the same test. But if you take it at a different time than the other students, then I got to make a new test for you. Uh, it's supposed to be, uh, and I try my best to make it comparably hard or comparably easy. But the main thing is it's going to be a different test if you can't take it at the same time as everybody else. Okay. <coughs> Any questions on that stuff? All right, uh, here's the course schedule. Uh, it's showing up right now. Is this what you saw uh, when you looked at it earlier? You said, it was, oh, I, bet, I know what you did. I bet you looked at the syllabus that we had. Yeah, throw that syllabus away that you were looking at. I think you were looking at the 242 syllabus from the Unite class. So this one didn't get screwed up. The one you have is probably wrong and likely has the wrong date. So make sure you get rid of that syllabus and download this one. Uh, anyways, today's the first day of class. You see that chapter 21 is started. It doesn't say anything here. So that means we're going on to chapter 21 the next day too. This week's lab is spreadsheet review. Then you see on uh, Tuesday of next week, we start chapter 22. And that's what we're doing on that day as well. So I've got it set up like this, and this is exactly the deadline. If I don't cover enough material, that's okay, because I've got enough material online uh, where I'm gonna show you everything and uh, get all the big concepts out so you know how to solve problems. And I'm gonna give you chances to solve problems uh, of all the different varieties. So uh, even if I don't cover one of the sections, you know you've got other uh, lectures you can go to to see what that was, uh, what 
what I did to teach that section. So we will keep on this very strict schedule. Uh, there's the last date of withdrawal with a refund. Uh, I also list the last date of withdrawal without getting a, uh, an F. Okay, so you make sure you do that. So all these dates should stay the same. The key dates are the online tests. Those are the ones you got to do on your own. And like I said, I normally make them available at least Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, and then they're due like Sunday or Monday. So you always have a whole weekend to do them. But a lot of times, most of the time, I give you a whole week. So uh, what I recommend as soon as you find out that I've opened up a, a test, you take that practice test a couple times and then just take a poke at the test. So you'll have some grade other than zero in there. And then later when you have time, maybe you can fine tune it and try to get as good a grade as possible. I'm only going to take your highest grade. So it doesn't matter if you have a couple bad ones, but what does matter is if you completely forget about it, I'm not going to open it back up. You're going to have to take that as your zero. And if you miss two of them, I'm going to drop you. Okay. So just don't do that. All right. Uh, and why I'm being so harsh on those dropping, they're really getting honest. We, they need us to stop. Basically, what's happening is some students are on uh, GI Bill, other students are on uh, financial aid, and, and other people are paying stuff. Well, the deal is, if you get dropped because of uh, not showing up, uh, then one, you're going to have an F. If it's after the due date, after the 21st of March, you're going to have an F. But more importantly, they're going to see that you didn't finish out the whole semester and that they kept sending you checks and they're going to demand their money back, which we have to pay. And then we're not going to let you back in. TCC is not going to let you back in until you pay us back. Uh, and of course, that goes in your record. So uh, that could mess you up going into other colleges. So just if you if you really want to drop, then do the process. Make sure you drop yourself. Don't just stop showing up. That that will really bother you. Even though you might get the extra checks, those checks are going to be a bill on you for the rest of your life. Uh, they, they, they never go away. Uh, student loans are the one that never go away. Uh, literally. Okay. So make sure you don't do that. Uh, the midterm you see is on the 3rd of March. It covers chapters 21 through 27. All my tests are comprehensive. That's why they all say starting at chapter 21. Really, I'm doing a online test every two chapters, but they're all comprehensive. So even though this one's mostly 23 and 24, it will include 21 and 22. And you can see I got a lot of them. I tried to make them in bold print, online tests for do. Notice I make them due at 8 a.m. The, the day of class so uh, so that I can put them on this calendar. I just made them do by 8 a.m. that morning and I didn't want students uh, missing class specifically because they were taking a test, right? Uh, that's just getting yourself in a deeper hole. So I say they're due at 8 a.m., meaning uh, you better be finished by 8 a.m. because it's going to disappear. Uh, here's the rest of it. You can see the final exam is actually on the 26th of April. Uh, this is where I told you you have to uh, uh, attend early or stay late. Also, if you actually come in late, that's a real problem. Uh, if you're face to face, uh, you're not going to get the full time. But if you're online, you're not going to get the full time either. So, for instance, if you came 15 minutes late, our class is supposed to start at 11. If you came at 1115, you wouldn't get the two hours and 10 minutes. You'd get an hour and 55 minutes. So, but that's on you. That's because you showed up late. So make sure you don't do that. I don't want you losing time even though i don't think you normally need that much time some students really do and it would bother them the other students have an advantage of it of more time all right uh what was that optional lab final so okay so there. yeah so if we if if i have to give a lab final it would be on that day uh generally what my grade is is 50 percent attendance and i'll explain that in a second and then 50 percent on your lab report grades which I grade very, you know, like the first one's going to be a, a, a smack in the face where I, I, you know, check everything that you did wrong and make a note of it. So you'll know, don't do that again. Uh, but all the other ones, usually, if you paid attention to that first grading, you'll do it right. And you'll get, you know, like a 95 or 100. Uh, so that's your other 50% of your grade. But if I find out over the semester, looking at people in their lab groups, and I see like one or two people doing all the hard work and making stuff be figured out and the other per person or the other two people are like wallflowers, then I'm gonna say those people aren't participating. And if I see enough of the people not participating in the lab, then I'm gonna basically punish everybody by giving them a lab final. And it's a comprehensive lab final. It's really hard. Students have a hard time doing it. My A students usually get like a, a low A on it. My B students usually get like a low B. Uh, my students that weren't quite getting stuff get really low Fs, 
Okay, so that's that's why I have that as an option. I don't want to do that. I don't like grading that. I don't like making that. <laughs> what I want you to do is participate in your lab. Even if you don't know anything, that's okay. You can help you, you can, uh, your lab partner can help you understand to some extent, okay? So that's why, why that comes in. The grading of that will show up later. Uh, and if you don't have me for a lab, it's an entirely different grading system. So your, your lab instructor will decide what their lab uh, procedure is going to be far as grade and they'll turn the, the lab grade as a number over to me and then I'll put that in to account for your grade. So make sure you use your lab instructor's lab grades, not, not mine, unless you have me. So here's how the grading works. Uh, I'm basically on a 10 point scale, but I get kind of generous. So, you know, I tell you up front, if you make an 89.5, I'm going to go ahead and round that to a 90, which is an A, 79.5, I'm going to round it to an 80, which is a B. Here's where I get generous. If you just make a 68.5, I will round that to a C. If you make a 58.5, I will round that to a D. Anything lower than that, you get an F. And here's where you see the weighted average. So uh, if you need to know how to calculate a weighted average, I've got a video on that too, but that's the way you can calculate your own grade and you really should keep track of your own grade that way, okay? Uh, because inevitably I've found numerous teachers, even at the college and university level who weren't doing their calculations properly, who were sort of just like throwing all their grades in together and taking an average, which is not the proper way to do it. So just keep that in mind. Uh, if you can't back up the calculation that they're doing, there's a good chance they're making some mistake or you just don't know what you're doing. So anyways, uh, what I'd do is I'd take the average after dropping one of your uh, online tests, I'd take the average of all those and multiply it by 0.1. Then I take the average of all these after dropping two and I multiply it by 0.2. I take the average of all these, uh, not dropping any and multiply it by 0.05. I take your midterm exam grade, multiply it by 0.2, take your final exam grade, multiply it by 0.25, and then I take your lab numerical grade and multiply that by 0.2. I add all those up and then divide by the sum of those weights, the 0.1 plus the 0.2 plus the 0.5 plus the 0.2 plus the 0.25 plus the 0.2. And of course, that adds up to be 1.00, and that's your course grade. OK, now be advised, I don't implement these dropping of grades until the end of the semester because I, I found that students sometimes get a little too cocky and don't study enough for their final when they're uh, lulled into a false sense of security about how, how high their grade is. So I don't implement those drops until like the last couple of days before the final. So your grade will run a little low in my lab uh, course, but you should be able to match it by just not dropping any of the grades. So if you want to do a comparison to check my grade calculations, then just don't drop the grades and you should get the exact same thing I do uh, as filled in Canvas. OK, now the lab grade, like I said, is 20 percent. Now, if you'll notice, all this adds up to not 100, but 105 percent. So the reason why it's 105 percent is I give you a 5 percent bonus. OK for taking those practice tests, which I can't believe I even do it because you're crazy not to take a practice test if a, if a teacher takes the time to make one up for you. You're just being insane not taking them up on it. So still, I find out that a lot of students don't do it unless I do this. So what I do is uh, each one of those tests that you have, you will have a practice test for. And sometimes they even have one for the final. Uh, and I take the average of all the highest scores that you got on those ones. So whatever the highest score for practice test one is, whatever the highest score for practice test two is, whatever the highest score for practice test three is, I add them up, divide it by the number of tests, and that's your uh, practice test score. Then I divide that by 20, and that many points is added to your course grade. Now, if you say missed or never took practice test four, then that one's going to count as a zero. So just keep that in mind. It's really crazy not to take a practice test. And one being a zero on there means you're going to get a lot less points. OK, now a special opportunity. Occasionally, I will give you problems to solve other than the, the homeworks and their extra credit. So the way I'll implement it is I'll throw them in the homework category and I'll change to drop the lowest two to drop the lowest three. If I make two of them, then I'll drop it to the lowest four and you'll get a zero if you don't do it. And you'll think, oh, well, they're punishing me because I didn't do an extra credit, but no, I'm not punishing you. It's gonna disappear when I drop them, okay? So just keep that in mind, that's how that works. Now, if you, I'm your lab instructor, the way it's gonna work is each day you come to lab and I'd notice that you're in lab and then you're like, if we're online, you go to the breakout room and you spend you know, more or less the whole time with your lab group. 
helping them, not just being in there and, and not hearing any words from you because I monitor that and I found students doing, doing that pretty weirdly. Uh, if you're doing all that stuff right, then you're going to get 50 of the 100 attendance grade that for that day. Then one week later, when the lab is actually due, you'll get the other 50 if you turn it in on time. Okay. If you turn it in late, it's going to stay a 50. Or if you miss the class, it'll be a zero. And then next week, if you turn it in on time, it'll be a 50. Of course, you got a 50 for that. And both of those don't result in a change in your grade. It'll say it's a change in your grade because I'll list it as a, in that case, you did one thing wrong. So I'll, miss that as, I'll, I'll list that as a 99 attendance grade. Uh, if you then missed another lab, uh, then you have missed uh, two and you turn in none late, you're still okay because I allow you two oopsies. It could be uh, two misses or it could be two late or it could be one miss and one late and nothing happens to your score. And the way I keep track of that is when you do one, I give you a 99. When you do two, I give you a 98. But at the end of the semester, if your grade's a 98, I still call it a 100, okay? If on the other hand, you go on and miss yet a third, then your grade becomes a uh, 95. And then if you miss a fourth, your grade becomes a 90, a fifth, a 85, so on and so forth. Okay, that's how the attendance grade is worked out. The other 50% is just the average of your really super awesome lab grades. Unless, again, unless the students aren't taking lab seriously, i.e. I've got some wallflowers that aren't participating, then everybody gets punished by me doing a final lab exam and that will count as 25% otherwise, uh, and then the uh, lab report grade will only count as 25%. So it has the ability to really screw up your course grade where you should normally have the lab uh, grade quite high and it often will bring up your lecture portion of your grade, but there's only one grade given for the whole course. So uh, that's what you gotta do. Uh, course communication, what I promise you and what I expect of you is spelled out here. I do uh, require you to check your email on all weekdays. That's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, I expect you to log into Canvas on every class day, which for you would be Tuesday, Thursday, but also Sunday as well. Uh, in fact, if we go to online, I will use those uh, logging ins as, as lates or as attendances. So if you didn't log in on Tuesday or Thursday or Sunday, I'll count that as an absence. I don't take off for absence, so that doesn't really matter. But uh, once you start to rack up too many absences, they either contact you or consider dropping you just because you might not be making uh, headway in the course and, and we're supposed to drop you for that. So anyways, just keep that in mind. Uh, if you email me properly, remember starting the uh, subject line with 242 D01B. Uh, if you email me on a Monday, you should hear back from me by midnight on Tuesday. If you don't hear back from me by midnight on Tuesday, that's when you're supposed to text me. Uh, similarly, if you email me on Friday, anytime on Friday, then you should expect my replies by midnight on Monday. If you don't get it, then you should text me. Okay. I expect the same thing of you though. So if I email you on Monday, if you don't reply to me by Tuesday uh, at midnight, then you've done something wrong, okay? So make sure you keep up with that. I prefer you not email me via Canvas. Don't ever do it, okay? Please don't do it. I just, I usually don't see it. It's a pain in the butt. It's just not, not good. My dean has asked us to explain to you that if you have a problem with your course, your instructor, the rules of my course, or some decision I made, you're supposed to bring that up to me first, okay? Uh, and then if you don't get it resolved to your satisfaction, then you go to the dean. But the deans are evidently getting calls like immediately. My instructor won't answer my email. Well, when did you send the email? Well, 45 minutes ago. Well, you're not required to. Nobody requires us to do. Most people just require two days. I, I require myself to do it in one day. So uh, anyways, they, they just get a lot of that. And you're, that's not really the proper protocol. It, does, it says so in the, in the handbook for the students. You're supposed to go to me first. Now, if it's something that you really feel uncomfortable about, make, maybe I made some joke and you thought I said something 
that was inappropriate. Uh, I apologize right now for doing so. I'm, there's some chance I might do it because I'm a goober and I make a lot of jokes and I don't always think as fast as I should. Uh, but if, if that was something that you wanted to bring up, first, I want to tell you, I would never hold that against you uh, if you're upset by that, no matter how innocuous I think it is. If you were bothered by it, I'm bothered that I, that I bothered you. So don't feel bad about coming up to me, but I would understand if you didn't want to take that up with me. Uh, so I, I wouldn't care that you went to the dean in that case, but just know that I wouldn't take anything out on you as students for something like that. But do uh, try to come to me first. Uh, it, that's about it regarding that. As far as the attendance policy goes, I don't really take off points or anything for attendance, but we have a federal standard that basically says uh, absence more than 15 percent, you're supposed to be kicked out. OK, so that is a problem. What I tell my students is you can miss up to four class days or two lab days uh, without getting kicked out. At that point, once you missed uh, four class days or two lab days, I'm completely free to withdraw you from the course. And they are actually compelling me, telling me that I need to drop you from the course. My bosses tell me that, OK, um, it's not me doing what I want to do. So if you have something going on and you need to convert it to online class for a couple of weeks because you're out of town, something happened or something like that, stay in touch with me. That way I can justify not kicking you out, okay? Uh, if I happen to withdraw you and it's after the 21st of March, which is almost the only time that I drop people was after the 21st of March, because that's usually when I notice that they've skipped a lot, uh, then they get an F. There's nothing I can do to change that. So make sure if you need to drop, you actually do the process of dropping. Don't just not show up and let me do it because you're going to end up with an F instead of a W. All right, uh, if a student misses a test, they must contact their instructor within 48 hours of the missed test, request an extension, or a grade of zero will be received for that, and I may uh, drop you from the course for skipping a test. That's the online test, the midterm, the final, any of that stuff, okay? So you really don't need to ever miss a test. An excused reason for missing a test is not that you're not ready for it, okay? Everybody's expected to have that test done by that day, Therefore, no one's special. No one gets to get an extra day just because they weren't ready. That's not a good excuse. If you have a valid, verifiable excuse, and I'm the one that deems whether it's very valid or not, uh, if you have one, then I will work with you. I might let you take a makeup. I might make a different one, and you take that. I might take and substitute the average of your online test for that particular test, or I might make that count as your one drop test. Okay, those are all options to me, but I just want to make sure y'all knew it. OK, the last day to withdraw without getting an F is the 21st of March. OK, uh, late work, like I said, you can do it. Not really test, though. You're not supposed to do tests late. OK, so keep that in mind. But the other assignments, when you turn those in late, uh, they'll just be deducted points. OK, uh, classroom behavior. I don't really have problems with that, but make sure you adhere to COVID-19 policies. Uh, I don't know if the schools requiring people to wear masks. I am vaccinated and I will wear a mask for classes when we're face to face, uh, just for the protection of you guys. Uh, if if the school requires you to wear masks, then you're going to need to wear a mask and you'll need to wear it over your nose. If the school doesn't require you, then I'm not going to require you. I'm just going to stick to whatever rules TCC says. Okay. Uh, I, well, I'll just say that I, I, I suggest people get vaccines. My research suggests that the uh, vaccine is safe, effective, uh, not as effective on the, uh, on the Omicron variant as it was on the, in the Delta or the Alpha, but it is still very effective. So uh, do what you want to. That's your life. I get it. But uh, just know that whatever TCC requires, I'm going to require. Uh, the main thing about electronic devices with me is they can't be out. Nothing that can access the internet or photographs of notes or anything like that can be out during a test, uh, at least not the midterm and the final. Of course, I've told you, you have full access to all that stuff on the online test, as long as it wasn't a document made since the test would be had been posted. The reason why I think you can see is obvious. Uh, maybe your boyfriend takes the practice test I mean, it takes the actual test before you uh, and then uh, doesn't want to be caught cheating. So he just makes a web page and has the problems and their answers worked out for you. And then you look at it. Well, he couldn't do that until the test was already opened. Uh, so that's what I'm doing is I'm just making it where you're not allowed to look at stuff that people have made after they've taken the test. Uh, inclement weather. The main thing is uh, if 
if they have to close a school and it's like in the in the middle of one of my classes or before my classes, then that class is canceled. Okay, so if they say the college is closing today, your class started at 11 and it's closing at 10.30 a.m., then this class is canceled because this class starts at 11. If they say the college is closed today at 11.30, this class starts at 11 but goes past 11.30, so this class is canceled. So that's the way that works for me. Uh, oh, yeah, if we're at the 85% point and we have to shut down, then the grades are going to be calculated as is with the existing grades. So that's something we have to put in there now. Uh, those are the deadlines that I told you about for dropping for tuition refund and then dropping without a, getting an F. Uh, don't, don't plagiarize. Don't cheat off of people, all that good stuff. Uh, I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to get y'all to print or electronically sign this last page, but you see here I put another link to my YouTube channel and another link to my YouTube channel there. And uh, then down here, this is the part where you might, I might require you to sign electronically or print out and sign and hand in to me. I haven't decided on that yet, but definitely read your syllabus. I don't want y'all making mistakes that so many other students have where you end up making a good grade, but losing it because you didn't dot your T and cross your I. <laughs> Everybody likes to dot their T's and cross their I's, right? <laughs> okay. Well, that's supposed to be funny. It's a dad joke. So what do you, what do you, what do you expect, right? All right, so now that we've done that, I can start talking to you about, and today we're starting chapter 21, which charge, uh, I can't remember the name of the chapter now, I can think of it, but I'm opening the book up to that chapter as we speak, and it looks like electric charge and the electric field. So chapter 21 starts off talking about, I still did the stop share, why is it still sharing? There it is. Uh, chapter one, it talks about, uh, charge it talks about conductors insulators stuff like that and uh like i said i'd normally show you a lot of cool demonstrations i want you to check out those mit links and there's other links in week one for some videos uh but basically uh what was discovered uh even by the ancient greeks is that there was a concept of magnetism which we're going to learn about later uh in fact rocks were uh, known to come from a town called magnesia and that magnesia rock was where we got the name magnetism from because those rocks tended to stick to other rocks uh, from magnesia and weird stuff like that. Well, also, if you were to, say, scuff your feet on a uh, cowhide as you're walking through your hut uh, and then you touch the spear, you might actually get a shock. So people notice that kind of stuff. And that was the origins of the electric force. Uh, the other one was the origins of the magnetic force. So uh, over time, we started learning ways to quantify these things. We uh, developed a sort of scientific method, if you will, uh, that's different in all scenarios, but basically it's sort of an observation process that requires a hypothesis, and then that hypothesis allows you to make a prediction, and then you observe whether that prediction is right, and then you make another uh, hypothesis or a more robust hypothesis out of the one you have, make another prediction, test it again. And if it goes through that enough, it becomes a full fledged modern theory. So for a long time, we used the theory to mean a bunch of different things like a hypothesis. It meant uh, uh, just a body of uh, knowledge, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, the modern day definition of theory is a, is a strong word. It should never be preceded by a, a diminutive adjective like just or uh, it's only a theory, right? That those are, those are referring to hypotheses according to the modern definition. In order for you to reach the modern definition of a theory, you have to be confirmed tens of thousands of times and never once been found wrong. That's, that's what a real theory is nowadays. So using all that process, you can uh, actually discover not only that there's charge, but there's two types of charge. And in fact, it was Benjamin Franklin's idea that we call one of those types positive and the other type negative. And how would you find out that they're different? Well, what, what you can find out is uh, maybe you take a piece of whatever preceded uh, uh, rubber in the 1800s and 1700s, perma, permaguji or something was the name of the, the word that they used to use permagutta permagutta that's what it was and it was sort of a latex type product made out of uh latex trees basically permagutta and anyways if you took 
something made out of that and rubbed it against your hair, it'd be sort of like rubbing a balloon against your hair, or for me, rubbing it against my sweaty scalp or something. Uh, but anyways, when you rub it against your hair, it turns out you can walk up to a wall or a ceiling and stick that permaguda to the wall or to that ceiling and it'll stay there. Well, that's kind of neat. That means there's some kind of attraction between the two. And we're going to learn about that kind of stuff. But what if you now take and rub that permaguda on, say, a piece of silk? Okay, maybe a silk garment or something. Well, then you take the silk garment and you bring it near the original uh, permaguda that you uh, used before that was charged by rubbing it on your hair. And all of a sudden you find that those two attract each other. Okay, that's kind of neat. Now maybe you take another piece of permaguda and you rub it on something else, say uh, bear fur. Well, when you do that, then you bring it near that first piece of permaguda and all of a sudden they repel. What you figured out is there's at least two types of things there. One type that was attracted to the first one and one type that was repelled, repelled from the second one. And they found out that was pretty much all of them. Okay, after doing a lot of experiments like that, you figured out that's all of them. So they realized there were two types of charge, uh, one being what, what Thomas, or excuse me, what Benjamin Franklin called positive, and the other being what uh, Benjamin Franklin called negative. And it just so happened that out of all the choices he had, obviously he had a 50-50 chance, he ended up getting it wrong. Okay, so the things that he thought compelled things to move, say, from what we now recognize as the positive terminal in a battery, so if you like, take like a double A or a triple A or a C or a D battery, they have the little nipple on top. That's the positive end of the battery. If you connect that to a wire, metal wire, a, a conductor, right? And then connect that wire to a load, like a, a light bulb or just a resistor or something like that. And then take the other end of that light bulb or resistor and connect it back to the, the flat negative side of the battery. Then, uh, Benjamin Franklin had sort of worked out that that type of charge was what he had called positive, and it appeared that that positive was going around, leaving the positive terminal. It's not really actually leaving the battery, by the way, but it seems like it's leaving the battery, going around through the source or through the, the load, and then coming back in the backside, and that appeared to be what was going on. Well, it turns out uh, that guess was exactly wrong because it turns out what really is going on is the ones that he thought were negative are actually leaving, pretending to leave the, the backside and go the other way around. The negative charges going their way around is really the current and the positive charges going the other way is what we call conventional current. And it turns out there's only one experiment you can do to discern which one's happening and that's called the Hall effect where basically you submerge that wire in a electric field and, uh, and a magnetic field. And basically one side of the wire becomes positively charged. The other side becomes negatively charged. That tells you that the charge carriers are actually negative, not positive. Uh, so unless you're doing something like that, you don't need to know which one's going on. You can just pretend like it is conventional current positive charges going around. And that's the way we'll treat it the whole semester, okay? So you can also take and uh, like we did with the permaguda with my hair versus the permaguda with silk versus the permaguda with uh, bear fur. You can also use other things instead of permaguda. You could use rabbit fur uh, or you could use rubber or latex or all sorts of things. It turns out you can then use the different ones, the ones that you call positive to check whether the other ones are positive or negative and you can sort of build up a table of, of compounds or objects in the, in the past, it was just objects, that when you rub the object with this thing, uh, then it produces the object being positively charged. But when you rub it with this thing, it becomes negatively charged. And you can put them in some order of, uh, that basically turns out to be modern day electronegativity from chemistry. So, uh, you know, the thing that's more likely to steal an electron is the thing that becomes negative, and that means it has a high electronegativity. The thing that is likely to lose an electron becomes positive and therefore has a low electronegativity, 
And in fact, by doing that with all the different combinations of things you can try and then getting down to actual elements and compounds, you could actually make a chart of electronegativity and chart it back to the periodic table and have something not unlike what we use in chemistry to figure out what's going to bond with what, what's going to lose an electron, what's going to gain an electron. So that's the way charge works, but charge is more important than that in that it actually has a law associated with it that is so important uh, that, it's, that it's even bigger than conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, conservation of angular momentum. Uh, in fact, conservation of energy is not always true. Remember, we can have non-conservative forces, which you'll learn later means the curl is uh, not zero. When the curl is zero, you have a conservative force. Gravity is a conservative force. The electric Coulomb force that we're getting ready to learn about is a conservative force. But friction, air resistance, uh, those things are not conservative forces. And what that means is basically, uh, let's say we remove the atmosphere from the Earth and we take a rifle and shoot it straight up. What we know, if we shoot it straight up, is the, the bullet will leave the barrel of the gun. And the instant it leaves the barrel of the gun, there's no more force acting on it. So it's basically in free fall. We know that it will shoot up at whatever the muzzle velocity is, reach some max height where basically all that kinetic energy, the one half mv squared that it had when it left the muzzle, is now equal to mgh, where h is the max height that it reaches. And then it'll fall back down and slowly the mgh will decrease at exactly the same rate the m, uh, one half mv squared a increases. And when it gets right back to the top of the barrel of the gun, which if it's done properly, that's what it's going to do. It's going to land right back in the barrel of the gun. When it gets back to this height, it's going to be going the exact same speed as when it left. That's because the gravity force was the only force acting on it, and that force is conservative. If you put the atmosphere back in, then it's going to come back and meet the tip here with a slower speed because some of the energy has been lost. So conservation of energy is not, not a uh, hundred percent a thing. And that's not even taking into account what we learned from relativity, which was it's not conservation of energy, but mass energy because energy can turn to mass and mass can turn to energy. Uh, so it's not because of that. It's literally just some uh, energy is stolen by dissipative forces. Similarly, conservation of momentum is only true when the net force on the system is zero. Conservation of, of angular momentum is only true when the net torque on the system is zero. So those aren't that big a deal, but there is something called conservation of charge, and that is 100% true. We've never found anything that ever violates conservation of charge. So that's one of the rules that we have to know. So what do we have to know? Well, we know that this class is PHY242, D01B, and we know this is 111.22, but we know that there are two types of charge. One's called positive and one called negative. Are we supposed to be seeing your document, Cam, sir? Yeah, I'm going to put that on. Thank you. Uh, I did forget, though. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, one, one type is positive, one type is negative. And, yeah, always let me do uh, remind me when I do something stupid like that because that's not an unheard of thing. So there's two types. What we also know is that like charges repel. So if you have a positive next to a positive, this positive is being pulled that way, and this positive is being pulled that way. Similarly, if you have a negative and a negative, this one's being pulled that way, and this one's being pulled that way. And unlike charges attract. So positive, negative, this thing's feeling compelled to move this way, and this thing's feeling compelled to move that way. Similarly, negative, positive, this one's compelled to move this way, and this one's compelled to move that way, and charge is conserved. Okay, so we can stipulate that as delta Q is equal to zero, or delta little Q is equal to zero, because that's the symbol we're going to use for charge, and the unit for charge, by the way, is equal to a Coulomb, OK? And a Coulomb is a big unit of charge. For instance, a, a moderate uh, lightning strike might only have a few hundred Coulombs transferred. So it's a, it's a big quantity is the Coulomb. 
All right. Well, we can start to now make sense of this by introducing Coulomb's law for force. And Coulomb's law for force uh, is very much like Newton's law of gravity. So Newton's law of gravity was an equation. He actually stated it in words. Uh, he said the force of attraction between two bodies is proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. We write that as F is equal to some constant, the gravitational constant times m1 times m2 over the distance between them squared. And f, of course, has units of newtons, which is a kilogram meter per second squared. m's, m1 and m2 have the same units. They're kilograms. And d has the unit of the meter, OK? So we find out that G experimentally is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newtons meter squared per kilogram squared, OK? And what Newton said is uh, this force is attractive. And it's only attractive. We've never found it to be uh, repulsive. And acts along. the line connecting their, oh, sit the in there, their centers of mass. So in other words, this would be mass one, there's its center of mass. This could be mass two. There's its center of mass. So you imagine a, long, a line here, and you'd say, OK, well, this is an attractive force. So M1 is clearly being pulled this way. And uh, M2 is clearly being pulled this way. But it acts along that line. OK, so that's what Newton law, Newton's law of gravity said. That gives you an idea how big it is. We got a formula all that good stuff. What well, turns out Coulomb's law, which by the way, there is some debate. We think uh, Ben Franklin may actually have beat Coulomb to making this observation. So Ben Franklin evidently was doing the same experiments about the same time, but you know he's somewhat in the backwater. So we're not sure uh, whether he actually did it at the same time or a little bit earlier, but it's interesting that he's part of it. And it was actually measured at the Cavendish uh, laboratory, I believe, if I remember correctly, and, and uh, in that case, it's uh, Cavendish is related as well. So there's a whole backstory to it, but really what it says in this case, and I'm going to uh, subscript this one with a G for gravity, I'll subscript this one with an E for electricity, and I'm going to use the constant K. Nobody uses the constant K, by the way, uh, but I mean, we're using it for like the first day or two, and that's about it. But in, instead of G, we have a K, and instead of M, we have a Q1 and a Q2. But we still have a D squared. And we still, in this case, we have attractive R repulsive. But acts along that line again. And this time it's from the center, centers of charge. OK, so all this stuff is the same. Now, as I said, Q has units of coulombs. Uh, K, uh, F has units of newtons. You can see what K is. In fact, K turns out to be 8.99 times 10 to the ninth uh, newtons meter squared per coulomb squared okay so that's what k is just like g so people might think well if that's the case then f e is about 10 to the 20th times stronger than f gravity and that's just by dividing the k by this not 10 to the ninth divided by 10 to the negative 11 is 10 to the positive 20th but in reality Let's do the hydrogen atom and see how they relate. We only got five minutes left anyway, so hydrogen atom. 
So what we have is a proton as a positive charge, and then we have an electron as a negative charge, and the distance between them is called the Bohr radius, A0, okay? Uh, so we can say Fe over Fg is actually equal to K times the charge of the electron and the charge of the proton are both the same. It's a very specific number. That charge is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Notice I'm not putting the signs of either one in here. I always use Coulomb's law to just calculate the magnitude, and then I decide which direction the force is acting by whether the charges are like or, or opposite. So there's one for the electron. There's another one for the proton. And then it's going to be divided by 0 0.529 times 10 to the negative uh, 10th meters squared, that's the Bohr radius. And then the gravitational force, of course, is G. Uh, and then this, of course, is divided by the mass. I should have put more room in there. So I'm gonna draw a line here. This is the big fraction bar. Now I'm gonna say it's G times the mass of the electron which is 9.109 .09 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms times the mass of the proton, which is 1.673 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms over again, 0 0.529 times 10 to the negative 10 meters squared. You can see already that basically this Bohr radius cancels out, okay? And uh, all we're gonna get is K divided by G times E squared. That's what this quantity right here is called. It's just the letter E and all that stuff. So when we actually do this calculation, I can take, I've got four minutes left. I can take 8.99, e to the nine times 1.602 e to the negative 19th. And now I'm gonna square that. I'm gonna divide the whole thing by parentheses, 6.67 e to the negative 11, still inside the parentheses times 9.109 e to the negative 31, still in parentheses, times 1.673 e to the negative 27. And when I'm all done with that, I get, and y'all can look at my what my calculator did. Yesterday, I seem to have done something wrong because I got an entirely different number. This is more like what I expected. Uh, yesterday I did this for the night class and I got 10 to the 57th, I think, or 58th maybe, but you can see this comes out to about two times 10 to the 39th. So I'm going to say this is roughly 10 to the 39 power. So what really is the case is the electric force is on the order of 10 to the 39th times stronger than the gravitational force. And that's why throughout this course, we're going to ignore gravity. Uh, when we're dealing with electricity, uh, electric forces and that sort of thing, there's no need to even bring up the gravity because the gravity is going to be so much weaker, at least 10 to the 20th times weaker, if not 10 to the 39th times weaker. So any questions on that? Well, next time we will finish up chapter 21. I'm going to introduce the electric field. I'm going to show you how to use this equation, but for the electric field, by the way, the equation for the electric field is just treating one of these as if it's the source and the other one's the, the thing that feels it. So if you divide the one that the source is out of it, so that would become without that Q1, now you have the formula for the electric field. The electric field is K times Q2 over D squared. That allows us to not think about forces acting over distances without seeing things. Uh, by bringing that in, we get a simpler equation that only has one ch uh, charge in it. And it turns out that thing 
seems to exist. We do, can do experiments and we can make predictions of what we expect it to behave like and lo and behold it does. So it's sort of like that field does exist. And then we'll render that into a vector form and we'll even do integrals and derivatives and all sorts of cool stuff with that. Uh, and you can already start checking out the uh, Coulomb law related stuff, uh, infinite charge, line of charge and uh, dipoles and all those things. You can go ahead and start looking up on uh, my YouTube channel and find some of those videos if you'd like so you'd be a little better prepared uh, for next time. Everybody's free to go. Thank you for coming. I'll wait for the last person to leave. Thank you. If you have any questions? Someone said something. Did they just say bye? Maybe. Feel free to ask me any questions if you have any. Everybody, have a good day, Jared. Sir, I have a question, but it's not regarding the material. Okay, let me go ahead and stop recording this part then.